in the immortal words of Ric Flair. <laughs> Woo! Man, if you can't get fired up after that, I don't even know what. I don't even know what. My goodness, my goodness. I don't, I'm, I'm honestly trying to figure out what it is I'm bringing to the table after that. <laughs> Thank you all for that time before the Lord's throne in praise. Goodness, goodness, goodness. I don't think you could put together a lineup of songs to speak more about a glorious message than that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to continue our study in um, Acts chapter 18. We are going to backtrack just a bit, but we're going to be starting in verse 12. But uh, we're going to backtrack before we go with the Lord in prayer. I'm just going to mention what we went over last week. We had Paul in a very low spot in his ministry coming into Corinth. And Corinth is not a good place. It is a red light district for the world. Talked about the temple prostitutes, no less than a thousand in attendance at any point in time. And in the service of the gods and goddesses, the more debauched your activity, the greater your worship of those false gods. And you can't help but go through this life right now. We may not have a temple designated for each of these gods and goddesses, but we are sure enough falling lockstep in their worship. And that's the thing that saddens me about this day and age that we're in. And I pray to the Lord that He has not completely lent them over to a debased mind. That there is still hope for salvation. There is still a time that we have to work in our community and beyond to bring people to a knowing salvation through the shed blood of Christ Jesus. As, the, as us that believe upon Christ as our Lord and Savior, that is our calling, that is our duty. And I want to remind us, we had at the very onset of Acts in chapter 1, verse 8, is sort of our outline. And I'll read that. And this is from Jesus himself to the disciples before his ascension. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This wasn't just to those disciples. Though this message, this proclamation, this duty is ours until we draw our last breath. Let's not forget that. And just to clarify with and put to ease some of our hearts and minds and our spirits burdened by some questions that we may have had in, in Sunday school. Our lack of the full knowledge of Christ's words should not be a hindrance to the things that are most important. We can go back to the, and I'm going to call it doctrine, because it is the key for all of us as believers. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the essence. If you've got that, the rest is just lanyap, as we call it here in Louisiana. There's a, that old saying, keep it simple, stupid. And I have to tell myself that every day. Every day. Multiple times a day. So the rest of it, we'll wait on through, ladies and gentlemen. 
but keep your focus on the essentials. And with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this family. Thank you that our extended family are gathered at this time around the world. And we join. We join them in lifting up your name in song, in praise, and in the study of your word. Lord, I pray that there be one more in the room of the remnant. And today would be that day. May all that we do and say glorify the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. So, again, we're here in Corinth, and our key verse from last week is going to continue to be our key verse moving forward. Uh, in verses 9 and 10, we'll go back and read this. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not be silent, or do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Amen. And one of the things, I don't know if we had an opportunity to, to touch on last week as we close with verse 11. It says, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. A year and six months. To this point, we've sort of picked up the, the scheduling. We sort of picked up the, the time frames of every city that Paul went into. He went into the synagogue. If there was a synagogue, he proclaimed Christ Jesus as the Messiah. And then he was elated by those who came to Christ. And he was driven out by those who refused. There surely wasn't an opportunity for a year and six months. Here, this is the longest tenure he stayed in any particular city. And this will only be eclipsed by his stay in Ephesus and his stay in Rome as we'll continue to study. So keep that in mind, a year and six months in one, one place. And might I say, a year and six months in probably the most corrupt of all the places he visited. I believe that's a, a correlation, there is a correlation there. There was a need and God allowed for that need to be met through Paul and his expounding of Scripture and leading people to Christ Jesus. But we're going to pick up here in verse 12. It says, When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. That was our study this morning and will continue, looks like to be so, for at least a week, maybe two about this judgment seat. This is the Bema seat. And this would be an elevated platform, as we discussed this morning, uh, elevated platform in the middle of the market, the Agora, in town. And it was used for multiple venues to make announcements to the citizens, to pass judgment upon disputes that were brought before in cases and then that and that's what we'll see here in just a bit and then also it was utilized as an area of administering reward to those who participated in sporting events one of the things that we need to understand about that is that not just anybody stands or sits above this beam of seat. I wish we had time to go into this further. If, if you would like to do that, you could join us in Sunday school in the fellowship hall and this subject matter right here we are going in depth uh, with. Had a great time this morning in the midst of it. Verse 13 says, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Isn't this something? These, Jew, the, the, these, these Jews that 
were hardened in heart, that railed against the teaching of Christ Jesus, have used every effort they possibly could. You know, they slandered and mocked, so they verbally abused. They stoned Paul to death in Lystra, and Lord raised him from that to go back at, right back into Lystra. And they've even tried to destroy his character, to refute his character. So now they've taken to the courts. Does that sound familiar in this day and age? Especially in Louisiana when every other billboard is McKernan or I don't even know all of them. But there's a commercial and a jingle for every one of them. Ambulance chasers. My goodness. But they are bringing this, and I, ha I had to do some dissecting here because I was concerned whenever they meant at the end of, of verse 13, were they determining it was Jewish law or was it the law of Rome? And just like Scripture always does, you just keep reading, keep, keep focused. I'll tell you what it means in just a second. And in, and in almost every case, actually every case, it does. Verse 14, And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. You all notice how that started out? And when Paul was about to. When you are doing what it is that God has called you to do, you are fulfilling His ministry in your life. He will determine what needs to be said and when. And right here, He is piggybacking on the promise that he gave to Paul in verses 9 and 10. Paul was doing what he was going to do. He was refuting those who were against him. And Jesus said, hold your tongue, son, I got this. He had many people in this city. Gallio was a proconsul. Basically, he was the governor, so to speak, over all of Greece. A huge, huge area. Gallio was the brother of Seneca, a philosopher that uh, we discussed very briefly, um, sort of tied with the Stoic philosophy, Stoicism. Basically, the, the Stoicism in its essence is basically virtue is sufficient for happiness. Seneca wrote of his brother Gallio, No mortal was ever so sweet to one as Gallio was to all. So even though we have no indication that Gallio at this point in time or after, had received Christ as his Lord and Savior, he was used through his creation, through what God had instilled in him as a person, his character, in this situation. And Jesus said so much in that dream, I have many people in this city. And Gallio basically said, guys... This is a Roman judgment seat. What does anything of Jew the Jewish nature have to do with the goings on of Rome? And he said, because I see it does not, get on out of here. Shoot. He actually drove them from the judgment seat. In verse 17... This is where it sort of gets a little sideways. 
that all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Two things came from this scenario. Because Gallio stated that this is something that I will not even hear, it set a precedent for Paul and Christians declaring Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because he said this is not something that Rome needs to delve into. He's basically stating that Paul and those who follow Christ can continue to keep on doing what they're doing. That this matter is between Judaism and a sect of Judaism, which at this time Christianity was thought by those outside looking in as just a faction of Judaism. And he said, hey, look, y'all's pet, y'all petty, uh, your petty little squabbles have nothing to do with us. Y'all figure it out. But in so doing, like I said, he set the precedent that in the areas of this region, Christ can be freely proclaimed. That's a milestone. And it also set a precedent to not bring these cases before the Bema seat. A nod on the head, like Sosthenes took here, is a good indication that this shouldn't take place again. I don't know if y'all know that or not. I'm thick-headed, uh, you know, it takes two, three, four, t four knots at times. Ask my wife. And poor Sosthenes. you got to understand, if you go back to verse 8, Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue. And him and his family came to know Christ as their Savior. They're, they, they've left the synagogue. They're following Paul. Remember, Paul had to move next door in order to be able to continue his ministry. So this guy is a week, two weeks into the, the job. And he's getting roughed up. There's a lot to go into that I could go into here. And I tell you, I feel prompted to do so. This Bema seat, this is the first that we see Paul mention this. He will mention it again in a couple of other verses. But we know the Bema seat as the place where those who know Christ as the Lord and, our Lord and Savior will be judged on what we have done or not done on His behalf. Now let me clearly state, this does not mean you will lose your salvation. That's not the case. It is what you have done for Christ and your reward for doing so. But one of the things I see here that I, th I think is astonishing that we see a fleshly, a worldly view of what is being brought. And I hope I'm not uh, spiritualizing this too much. There is no word, there is no defense that you are going to bring before Christ at that Bema seat. There are things we're going to see where level uh, areas where we drop the ball. There are going to be areas that we, through the boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit, had served Christ to the nth degree. But there will be nothing to defend yourself before the Bema seat. And I see, I see that in both cases, uh, mainly here where Paul has, didn't have to say a word. His mouth was sort of supernaturally closed. And as we have seen, Paul through the past verses leading up to this and what we'll continue to see, that's a hard thing to do. And I think only the Holy Spirit could do that. But one of the other things that I see here that, that is Gallio 
said, this is not a matter to be brought before this Bema seat. Guys, y'all need, need to wait until the great white throne of judgment. This is not the place. And so much so that you're going to get roughed up before you're sent off. Because you got it wrong. Just something that I saw in the midst of reading that, that, that I was like, man, this is just peculiar, verse by verse, step by step, how this is laid out. But we'll continue on in verse 18. It says, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off in Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now there's a lot to unpack right here. I mean, just a, a, a great deal. One, we got Priscilla and Aquila. They are quickly, you know, there's some people that you, you go through life with and it takes quite some time to become uh, or develop a relationship, a friendship. And there are some people that you just hit it off instantly with. And I think with Paul, Priscilla and Aquila were just an instantaneous relationship that will pay dividends and will be long lasting because we will see their name time and time and time again uh, as this story unfolds and as uh, Paul continues to write. So Paul said, hey guys, I'm heading back home. And it's time for me to check in. You guys want to come? And they're like, let's roll. Shotgun, you know. So they head on, they head on, they head on with Paul. And then notice he had his hair cut off in Sincrea for he had taken a vow. Now that's a head scratcher. Paul, I thought you'd been preaching that the Mosaic Law is of no importance. It's in Christ, you, the, the law is gone. It's dead. It's through the grace of Christ. But if you notice, this right here is not one of the Mosaic Laws as to how many steps you can take on the Sabbath and, you know, uh, how many, what you have to do in the hokey pokey dance to do this or the other. It was, this was, this was the aspects of, how would, how would I put this, of the ceremonies of Judaism. And one of the things that we see here, because the, the, which vow he took is not disclosed. However, we can take from him the fact that he shore his hair meant that he was letting his hair grow. And we can also infer to the amount of time that he was in Corinth, uh, a year and six months, in that we can say, oh, wait, this is uh, this particular vow would be one where he abstains from anything of the, of the vine. No grapes, no raisins, no wine, none of that stuff. And then he would abstain from dead things, whether that be animals, whether that be people, the whole nine yards. Uh, a Nazarite vow is what we would call this. And then what they would do, they would shore that, cut that hair off, and then they would bring that as an offering to the temple, which we will see him. That is where he's heading at this time to take part in this feast. The feast is not given either, which you know, doesn't allow us to plug things together in great detail. However, this could also be a thank offering. Can you imagine Jesus Christ coming to you in a vision and encouraging you in a very, low, very, very low moment in your life and saying, hey, you keep on doing what you're doing. I've got your back. I could see a reason for a thank offering there. And it would be the same thing. They'd shave the head, 
present that, that hair as an offering, and they would not take part in any other ceremonial uh, things at that time, events at that time. So that gives you a couple of options as to what this particular one is. We won't know. Again, there, there's another one on that list. I don't know if you can get enough paper in a casket. I know it isn't going over with me to heaven, so I'm going to have to... You, I'm going to plug this into those three brain cells and pray that I can remember all this to be able to ask these questions once we're over in heaven. And notice this in verse 19. And he came to Ephesus. Do you all remember at the onset of the second missionary journey, Paul said, hey, I'm going to, let's go to Asia. And the Holy Spirit said, no, sir. That's not happening. And then he said, well, we're going to go to Bithynia. Uh-uh. And then he ended up getting that Macedonian vision of the Macedonian man only to cross the waterway over there and come across a bunch of women. But yet, right now, he is rolling right into the heart of Asia. Can I say here that sometimes whenever we, in our headstrong flesh, determines we know what Jesus wants us to do. And then those things don't happen quite like we want them to. Can I relay to you that maybe this is the Holy Spirit being the voice of Jesus saying, just wait. There's a time and there's a season for this, but just not now. If we look back to that onset of that second missionary journey, we realize that if Paul would have continued in his own way of thinking, in it, with his own plan, he would have never come across Luke. Do y'all realize that if you've never come across Luke, we would never have the book of Acts before us? And I would go far, so far as to venture to say we probably would not have had the book of Luke, the gospel. So there is a reason for the things God allows us to do, and there is a reason even in the things that He tells us to wait or he does not allow to happen. Spiritual discernment is one of the things that I believe we need to pray a little more about, especially myself, foremost. I love this. As he was in the synagogue reasoning with the Jews, when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, hold on, catch this. He's in the synagogue with the Jews. It isn't a divided house. Some receiving and the rest of them wanting to knock his block off. They said, hey, can you stay a longer time with him? This is the same Paul that wanted nothing more to, to go to Asia about two years ago and was chomping at the bit to do so. And it, verse 20 concludes, he did not consent. Verse 21 it says that, But he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. <laughs> He's got a group of people that want nothing more but to continue to hear him proclaim the gospel message. And he's like, I got somewhere to be. That just, it's, to me, it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. However, even in the midst of that, it says, uh, I was trying to find that here. Well, it doesn't say it at this particular part. We'll read this again as we go further into 
chapter 18. But essentially, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. He leaves Priscilla and Aquila here. What an opportunity. He spent this 18 months working alongside them, serving alongside them, ministering alongside them, building them, them up while they are building him up and encouraging him to continue in his ministry. And he gives them the opportunity. Hey, you've got a crowd here that is beating down the door to hear the gospel message. Here's y'all's chance. And I love it because we have, <coughs> excuse me, I love it because we have the chance to see this husband and wife military, I mean, a military, ministry duo um, get their first opportunity to sort of minister to an ent entire city. And Ephesus is a large city. The unfortunate part, and we'll get into a little bit later, is Ephesus is a city that has been corrupted with, in Louisiana, we would call it voodoo, but ritualistic spells and incantations, those kind of things, were ab they abounded in Ephesus. So there are some seedy elements there. Fortunately, they're not so much in that synagogue and they're able to continue to minister there and become quite prosperous uh, as far as, when I say prosperous, not financially or anything like that. They didn't set up the first Baptist church or what at Ephesus here or anything like that. They were prosperous in bringing people to a knowing salvation of Christ Jesus. So he sails to... Uh, away from Ephesus and in verse 22 and when he landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church he went down to Antioch so he has gone into the coast of Caesarea come out went to Antioch which is we have know by now is his home church that is his sending church for his missionary efforts uh, it is the church that is basically taking the place in sending out the gospel message for the original church there in Jerusalem. Do you notice you notice there it's, it's hard to see with this phrasing in verse 22 and when he landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church. Y'all see that there? In that Middle East region, Jerusalem was the city on the hill. Anytime you were going to Jerusalem, you were going up to Jerusalem. Anytime you were leaving Jerusalem, you were going down to Antioch, which we have right here, spelled out that way. So he went to the church, <clears throat> the church in Jerusalem first. And notice that there are no details given. There are no aspects of this visit that are expounded right here for us. And it almost, you know, we can't add to God's Word. We don't want to put something there that's not there. And that's why I, when I mentioned that before in the verses, that's my sort of interjection. However, here... I don't know if there's just not there's not a connection there with the Church of Jerusalem and Paul anymore. Maybe there's some discord between them or something of that nature. Or it could be simply there just wasn't anything to take place to expound on. But we knew he went here for a feast. And that's not given. It's not given, you know, what took place in the middle, middle of that feast or anything like that. So that's one of those odd ones uh, that we come across in Scripture. But like I said, we can't add to it because it's not there to, to lend credence to. 
But he did go back to Antioch. And there it does expound a little bit in verse 23. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia Phrygia, and Phrygia in order to strengthen all the disciples. So immediately we went from verse 22, and in between verse 22 and verse 23 is the start of the third missionary journey. Just that quick, just boom. And that, now this came later, you know, of course, the Bible was not given all these numbers and all those kind of things and, and these uh, uh, paragraph headings and all that kind of stuff. That came way down the road. But it does make you wonder, why, well, when, why did they split this up and not start something new and fresh here, notating this, this journey, this third journey? And it's because of the next character that we're going to meet. And I'm going to start in this because this is going to be a prelude to 19. We're going to finish out 18, getting to know Apollos. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Al at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So as Paul left to go back to Jerusalem for the feast and to give his uh, hair offering, uh, whether that be thanks or, or whatnot, then he come up, to, he come down rather, let me get my bearings right, up and down to Antioch and spent time with his home church sharing what took place and the, and the like. And while all that was going on, Apollos comes into Ephesus. And it says that a certain Jew <clears throat> named Apollos. So, he's named after a Greek god, but he's a Jew. And he was born in Alexandria. And I don't know if y'all... Alexandria probably makes you think of Alexander the Great. Well, there's good reason for that because he is the one who conquered and named uh, Alexandria in Egypt after himself. And it had one of the greatest libraries known to mankind at that, uh, at that time. Very, very intelligent people were there in that hub and it had a huge Jewish population. So hopefully that'll clear up a little bit of how all this came to play. But you notice an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. So this was a learned gentleman. Somebody who was a great orator. Far better than I'll ever come close to. He was able to draw people in and gather and garner their attention. But he was, he was able to do so and back it up with the scripture. Sounds good, but listen, listen closely here. Verse 25, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Well, hey, kudos, there we go. That's, that's a good step. And being fervent in the spirit. Oh man, we're building up right now. Knows the scripture, is, can speak, can orate. Pontificate. There you go, Leah. Here's one. And had been instru instructed in the way of the Lord and was fervent in the Spirit. Here we go. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. Hey, man, he is going down this list. As, as somebody who is looking to hire Apollos, man, I'm going down this list. I'm like, man, this is, this is, uh, what is that old song? future so bright I got to wear shades I mean this is literally where we're at right now this thing is gleaming and then at the end of 25 though he only knew the baptism of John burr, 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 burr. I mean doggone looking so good I wish we had time in, in the middle of this session to be able to see what that meant but we know enough about the story of Christ's story and his cousin, John the Baptist, to know that John was declaring, repent for the time is near. And he was saying that 
you must be baptized. And he was saying that there is one that is going to come that he is not worthy to loose his sandals. He was talking about the coming Messiah. And Jesus himself said that, that, John, John, uh, yeah, that John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets. But yet outside of Christ, what difference does it make? I don't know if you guys venture into our our famed SNA service station here in Keyfield. They are the fried food mecca of Keyfield. And you go in there and there's fried everything. And you know, fat boys like myself, you know, we did. It's almost like that. Remember the Pepe Le Pew cartoons? And you see him, he gets a whiff of the, the, the other skunk with the perfume or a cat and the perfume on it, and he's just floating. That's me to s &A, just to let y'all know. If y'all get up early enough in the morning, you'll see me float right down that road. Right now. <laughs> I went to s &A not long ago in order to meat pie. And then people are going to be watching this later and be like, meat pie, what? What in the world is this guy talking about? Look up the city of Natchitoches, and then you can find what a meat pie is. So, anyway, get this meat pie. You know, you're chomping at the bed, and you can tell that I've, there's not been a day in my life where I've starved. Uh, but get this meat pie, and I'm, and there is not a thing inside of it. You know, of course, as a good Baptist would do, hey, I ain't going to stop this. I ain't giving up. There was absolutely nothing in that meat pie. I'm halfway down Barron Road thinking the Lord has just left me. He's just, he's just gone. And I'm thinking I need to pull over, but there's no shoulders on Barron Road. And I'm like, oh. I need, to, I need to repent for something. There's something I need to do. There's no way this can happen. But that is like Apollo's ministry at this point in time. Oh man, it's going to draw you to it. You know, you can taste it. You can feel it. This is, this is the right thing at the right time. But there's nothing in it. There's no substance there. But I love this about Apollos. We're going to learn a few things about him. This man, in verse 25, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Oh, we already went through that. Though he only knew the baptism of John. Verse 26, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. He was taking what he knew and he was proclaiming it. Can I tell you that even in the midst of that, he was getting people ready. He was planting a seed, just like John the Baptist did at the coming of Christ. He was making the way. When, Aqu when Aquila and, and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately, more completely, more fully in some of your Bibles. Do you notice in order for them to be able to explain to him more fully, to help him develop, to bring him to Christ, he had to be receptive. You stop and think about that that list of the things that he was excelling at. Most people, when they deem themselves something, they are closed off from anything else. When people in love 
with the best of intentions try to come alongside somebody like that, most of the time they're shunned. What are you going to bring to me that I don't already know? You ever met anybody like that? But that's not the case. They were able to add the most important ingredient to what it was that he was proclaiming. And that was the blood of Christ Jesus shed for our sins. We're going to finish out these last two verses. And when he desired to cross, to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. And this is how he was able to do that. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He took that offering of Priscilla and Aquila. He learned from them. He did not shut them out. And you, know, you have to know that everything up to that point that he was taught through Scripture was made clear through Scripture that he had left a few details out. Critical details. He learned. He continued to learn. He didn't say, hey, look, this has got me this far and I'm sticking with it. Ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, don't let a day pass you where you don't learn something new about your Lord and Savior. That should be sort of second in line. First thing was what we read there in Acts 1.8. We need to be proclaiming the good news of Christ Jesus to all those that we come into contact with. Second of all, we need to know more about the Christ Jesus we serve. And we need to do that daily. We need to be spending time in God's Word daily. We need to be spending time in prayer, in communication with our Lord and Savior daily. And if you're like most, somebody told me the other day about a pledge Bible. And I sat there and I scratched my head. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of this before. I scratched my head, a pledge Bible? I, don't, I guess I've never seen that version of it. And he said, that's uh, those folks that Sunday, they come and they put it on their nightstand or their table or whatever. And Sunday, the next Sunday morning, they have to get up and spray some pledge on it to wipe it off to make it look, look like it ain't collecting dust. Pledge Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not a, what a relationship is like. Let me tell you what, guys or ladies, either way, go home and try to do that with your spouse. I'm going to drop you off on Sunday, and I'll see you again, talk to you, spend time with you, you know, whatever, the next Sunday. Let me tell you what, if you want to see what a doomed relationship looks like, try that out. It's the same with our Lord and Savior. And Apollos, man, he was wide open to it. And you know, Priscilla and Aquila had to say, this guy has what it takes, if only who knew. And you know, they, they weren't scared. That's the beauty of, of, of Priscilla and Aquila. They weren't scared to approach him and say, hey man, brilliant. Love it. But let, me, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. The one, the Messiah that John was proclaiming. Now we can't go in to figure out what it was and how it was that Apollos somehow forgot or did not know or wasn't made aware that Jesus came on the scene. But you do have to think about where John was at. He was in the wilderness. Not very many newspapers go through there. Signal for your cell phone, 
non-existent, spotty at best. So there is a means by which he did not and, and was not able to receive the message of Christ Jesus. But when he did, just like we should today, when he got the full message of Christ Jesus, he clinged up to it and he held on to it and he gave all to it. Which is where we'll close today. Are we willing to continue our relationship with Christ Jesus? Are we willing to engage and stay engaged daily in prayer, in God's Word, and all the various resources that are out there to learn more about the one we serve? Are we just those that, like we mentioned this morning, I've got my get out of jail free card and I'm just going to... I'm going to set cruise control until I draw my last breath or I hear a trumpet. Unfortunately, that's the way a lot of us Christians have become. Complacent. With what we see going on across this world, especially in Israel right now, complacency has no place in our life as Christians. If there was ever a red buzzer on the dash of your car that says you need to do something pronto it's Israel and what we see taking place there and the thing we need to do is make the proclamation of Christ Jesus known to everybody we come across just like we saw here with Paul God will give you the words if you're willing he will even shut your mouth when there's the time is necessary. He will guide your steps. The only thing you have to do is say, Lord, I will. Like Samuel, when he was in that, in that temple and God was calling him. Like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. Those promptings, those urges are not just something for you to sit there and wait it out. They're not something that says somebody else will take care of it. It'll, if I just stop long enough, this will subside. This is an acid reflux, ladies and gentlemen. This is the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life to share the good news that you've received with others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful for your word. It sends chills down my spine to think that there are other people groups that are trying to serve you, that are trying to learn more about you, to try to build a relationship with you that do not have access to Scripture. And Lord, even the thought that in this nation founded upon Christian principles, there could come a day where we no longer have access to this word either. Lord, I pray that we would not take or not let this opportunity and this blessing and this freedom be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. 
Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fall upon your people here today. Myself, first and foremost, Lord, that you would embolden me and those in attendance. to share the gospel message and the good news of our salvation through your shed blood. And Lord, for those here today that may not know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that they would not let this opportunity pass them by. Like Miss Patty said before, this altar does not have time limits. There are not time slots. This altar is available at any point in time. Lord, I pray that we would use it, take advantage of it. If there's anybody that doesn't know you as our Lord and Savior, it doesn't take much but everything you have. And a simple prayer lays the foundation. And for anybody who has lost their way, this altar is available for you to lay that down before the Lord as well. Or if you need somebody just to pray with you through a circumstance, now is that time. <coughs> May your Holy Spirit sweep through this room. Prod and provoke us as you wish. In the precious name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.